And now, it's time for everybody's favorite ocean liner game show, Bullshit! Here's your host, Michael Brady! Ladies and gentlemen, it's me, Michael Brady. Welcome to Bullshit, everybody's favorite ocean liner game show. Also the internet's only ocean liner game show, so that was a... That was an easy title to earn. Welcome, this is the first episode. I'm very excited to announce that today I've got a uh, very special guest. Please put your hands together for the original Ocean Liner Renaissance man. He's done everything from film to documentary and video games, as well as interpretive dance. Mr. Thomas Linsky, ladies and gentlemen. How you doing, Mike? It's good to be here. You know, you, um, you're flattering with that intro there, although um, I don't know where you're coming from with the interpretive dance. No, you know. I've seen those videos, Tom. I've seen them. Have you? Because I haven't. <laughs> Welcome. It's good to have you here. Now, when I when I mentioned that we would be doing something like this a few weeks ago, you were really keen to um, to jump on board and do the first episode. So it's really good to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for uh, absolutely thanks for agreeing to do it. Glad to be here. Now you've been a very busy man recently. Uh, you've been doing a lot of projects and things. Tell us uh, what have, what have you been doing? I, I've been really busy actually uh, with with work with my with my day job. Uh, I work for the studio in Los Angeles, and uh, right now we have this government contract where we are developing training simulators on a government contract, essentially training psychologists um, to handle diagnoses and therapy sessions a little bit better, and I'm the content developer for that, so uh, I basically have to write all these mock-up um, therapy sessions and go into the psychology of it and and make sure that the content being written trains these psychologists in a in a positive way. Um, that's chewed up a, a lot of my time, but one thing that I'm sure you're aware of, because you've been working on it, so you have to be aware of it by now, is uh, the Lusitania Virtual Museum experience uh, that you've been involved with and uh, some of my other friends have been working on as well. I've been trying to keep it a little on the down low because I didn't want to overhype something before we had something of substance to show but just today I was recording an update video the first ever announcement video to show what that project is and uh, that might even be up before this bullshit video comes out maybe not I don't know I don't know how fast you edit man well you know uh, Tom I'm from Australia so technically uh, we're in the future I've already seen it it's already come out um, it's fantastic I've even already played the game <sighs> I didn't know you guys were that far in the future. But today, we're not working together. Today, we're actually competing. Because although I am the host of this game show, today I'm also a contestant because we have no budget and I, I literally couldn't get anybody else. I am the budget contestant. <laughs> I come for free. <laughs> that's actually not kind of what I was getting at, but that's also very funny. Okay, so here's how Bullship works for those uh, playing at home, and also for you, Tom, because I think I've done such a bad job of explaining this so far. We're going to take it in turns telling each other ocean liner facts. Now, these are facts that we have each come prepared with. Some of them may be true. They all may be true. Some of them may be Bullship, or they all may be Bullship. It is really up to us. So we're going to take it in turns to tell each other uh, three ocean liner facts. We're going to do it in three rounds of three, and then a final, uh, final round right at the end there. Uh, because we've got one question that was submitted by a, uh, a patron, one of the Ocean Liner Designs crew members. Are you ready to play Bullship, Tom? I am totally ready, but before we begin, may I suggest a friendly wager? If I win, when I win, you have to send me one of those beautiful prints that you sell on your store. Of my choosing. I won't go too big, I won't bankrupt you, but if you win, I will send you two copies. Uh, stolen, starring Nicolas Cage. I will actually send you two copies, so if one gets stolen, you have a backup. I also have a, um, a blank lined journal right here. Um, nothing in it, it's just, it's just lines. And on the cover it says, uh, Sorry I wasn't listening, I was thinking about Louis Anderson. I'll send you that. That seems fair. That seems fair to me. Excellent. Shake. Shake on it. Done. You're a lunatic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. 
Here we go. Question one of the entire series, of the entire history of bullshit. No pressure. You better get this one right. Henry Nestle, founder of the Nestle Chocolate Company, or in 1912, known as the Nestle and Anglo-Swiss Condensed Milk Company, and his family were booked to sail on the Titanic in first class, but they canceled at the last minute due to his wife's health. True or false? What was wrong with his wife? You can't ask me questions, because like if I give you... Yeah, no, that's true. It is my game show though, so I can kind of do what I want. But that's okay. I don't. I don't need the. I don't need it because I know that that fact is uh, is bullshit. Is it really? Yes. How do I know that? That yeah. Is how do you know that that's bullshit? I'm from the future, and I've seen this episode, and you you tell me that it's bullshit. I can't fault that logic. Yeah, it's it's bullshit. Okay. Hey. Do you know what's really <laughs> annoying about that one? What? It's not entirely bullshit. I was really hoping really? to stump you. Yes, because it was Milton Hershey of Hershey's Chocolate. The whole rest oh. of that fact was not mm. bullshit. I was really hoping you would know the Hershey fact and just be like, oh yeah, the Nestle chocolate guy, that is a true story, and just... And I would have conflated the two. That, see, it's faultless logic, but um, I just know everything about ships, so... Well then, I, I don't stand a chance here. <laughs> <laughs> In the First World War, a German ship was redecorated and dressed up to look like the Cunard liner RMS Carmagna in order to infiltrate the British supply lines. The first enemy ship that it encountered was the real-life RMS Carmagna, which promptly sank her. I know that this one is true, because it's so ridiculous. It is true, it was the German ship Cap Trafalgar. Cap Trafalgar. So did they repaint it as a Cunarder as well? Like the whole thing? Yeah, because like she kind of had a similar structure, two funnels, and uh, they just repainted her up and uh, slapped her on the rump and sent her on her way. And <laughs> the one <laughs> ship in the entire world who would know that she of was all not the, the, the joints <laughs> of all of the the dead end seas yes. to go into. <laughs> <laughs> That is the ship she runs into. A fascinating tidbit. Thank you very much. Mr. Linsky, your third fact, please. A passenger was killed in the sinking of the Lusitania after having been torpedoed by the German submarine U-20. And when the body was being transferred to the United States, the transferring ship was also sank by the U-20, having uh, made this person essentially a victim of the U-20 twice in a row. Wow. Uh, ooh, okay, I've never heard about this one, but it, it sounds fairly convincing. I'm going to say that is true. I'm not doing too well, am I? It was uh, first class passenger Francis Stevens, and the ship really? was the Hesperian. Oh my goodness, that is so unfortunate. Very unfortunate, yeah. Obviously the body was lost, and uh, yeah. Okay, well again, another case of extremely bad luck. Um, incredible. All right. Well, that's your first three down. I'm, I'm three up on you, Tom, but here's your chance to, uh, to get me back. If you can uh, guess if these are true or bullshit, you will, of course, be earning points. But if my bullshit questions trick you, I will get a point myself. So don't. So don't in get short, wrong, I'm going to get wrecked. Fine. Don't, don't. You'll, you'll be fine. Uh, fact the first: the mascot of the German liner SS Bremen was a lion cub named Simba, which is the Swahili word for lion. Um, he was actually taken off the ship after only four voyages, as he had started to get too big. That one sounds true. You're rolling with true? I'm rolling with true. That is bullshit. Uh, there was a mascot lion cub named Simba, but it was actually the mascot of a German fighter squadron during the Battle of Britain in France. See, so you pulled the uh, same trick I tried pulling on you, except I fell for it. I completely guessed, by the way. I was leaning towards Nestle being true. But, you know. Fact the second. Uh, the captain of the SS Angelino Lauro, the Italian ocean liner, had a bright red Ferrari sports car, which he would keep packed on board and have his crew unload it uh, at foreign ports uh, with cargo cranes so he could drive it around. I'm gonna go with true on that one. This one is true. This is very true. So Captain Enzo Umarino uh, was the the fabled captain of the, the Angelina Lara. 
And uh, legend says that he had he had a bit of a reputation and his attitude was so poor that one day his crew and the stevedores worked together and dropped the crate with the Ferrari in it uh, about 30 feet and it was written off. Oh, man. Well, I have to give a shout out to Eric Lara of the Lane Victory, who is a mutual friend of ours because he told me that fact just a month ago. Well, Eric is never getting invited onto this show <laughs> because of it. Bad luck, Eric. Designers originally intended for the SS Normandy to feature a 23 foot tall bronze male nude statue on the aft first class veranda, but it was removed due to vibration issues. Um, statue of a nude guy getting vibrated sounds very French to me. I'm going to go with true. The logic is faultless, and you're completely right. There was going to be a statue called the Genie de la Mer on the aft, uh, aft veranda. It was taken off. Which just goes to show that modern art can really get you rattled. <laughs> Mr. Linsky, start off second round, your first fact, please. All right, all right. Tom Hanks' story in the film Castaway was actually inspired by the story of the only surviving postal worker from the 1875 shipwreck of the SS Pacific. I like that you've gone for my uh, area of expertise, obscure 19th century ships. Well, then you should know this one. The field I'm renowned for. Oh, you got a 50-50 chance? True. Good. Thank yeah, you. No. That's true. Made it up. Ugh. Was there a, a ship named the Pacific? That's oh, yeah. And it sank in 1875. And um, one survivor, not a postal worker. But I figured I would trip you up by the fact that I said postal workers, and if you've seen Castaway, you know he works for FedEx. You know, that, that package that he keeps and he never opens, the uh, producers and the staff, as a joke, kept a satellite phone in it, a solar-powered satellite phone. I saw that FedEx commercial. <laughs> 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 okay, Miss Linsky, well done. I'm only up by one, so you're clawing your way back. Uh, your second fact, please. Okay, um, sticking with films. The Grail Diary prop from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade details a vital clue to the location of the Holy Grail that was lost in the sinking of the Titanic. That was lost in the sinking of the Titanic? Uh, uh, bullshit. That one is true. I actually have a scan of the Grail Diary prop and there's a whole section devoted to the Titanic. It, I mean, what the contents are bullshit. Like, because they just made it up. But it talks about, you know, it's from the, the film is from, um, it's all the research by Henry Jones, his father, played by uh, Sean Connery. And, uh, Sean the, Connery. The, yes, the diary was, like, written by him, and he talks about in 1912 a friend of his is coming over from England with some documents, I don't know, and um, went down with the Titanic. His friend survived, but the documents were lost. Wow, I can't believe I didn't get that. I know. I, how... I find that film infinitely quotable. You know what I mean? I suddenly remembered my Charlemagne. <laughs> <laughs> Junior! <laughs> well, fortunately, the diary was not quotable. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. I'd be impressed if it was. Uh, brilliant. Well, we're neck and neck. It's, it's a tie at four, four points each. Mr. Linsky, you're third and final for the second round. There was a steam airplane on board the Titanic. Bullshit. No. What? Supposedly, I am quoting Jack Eaton on this, and I don't know what his source is, but there were parts for one of, if not the only, steam-powered airplane in history in the cargo hold. Unbelievable. But I... I know everything about ships. How could I not have known this? That was a good one. I knew that question would come in handy sometime, that little tidbit that apparently only me and Jack Eaton knew. Yeah, well, you're, uh, it's got you up by one point, so, Mr. Eaton... I feel I'm going to lose on. that lead in the next three questions. All right, here we go. Canadian children's book author Clara Joffin is the great-granddaughter of Titanic baker Charles Joffin, and his story inspired her to write her breakout young adult novel, Silence of the Night. Can I phone a friend here? No. I have a Canadian in the room. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's super well-known, um... She's not going to come up. Um, bullshit. 
you're right, you're right. Um, Clara Joffin is not related to uh, Charles Joffin because she doesn't exist. I made her up. That was good. That was very clever. Very niche. Um, nobody knows about Canada, so I figured that... Good, that's impressive. <laughs> I thought I'd have you with that one. I forgot you had a Canadian. <laughs> was, was she shaking her head in the corner of her eye and She you... didn't even look up. She's scrapbooking. Okay, brilliant. Excellent. Okay. Fact number two. Uh, SS Ile de France, the French ocean liner, almost sank at her own moorings in the St. Nazaire Basin uh, when crew mistakenly set about casting off and powering up the engines with nobody at the bridge or helm. Uh, quick thinking actions by the captain saved the ship. Oh, that's a big oof. True. Completely true. Uh, this was Captain Joseph Blancart. Um, he rushed to the bridge and could see that right at the end of this basin, there's like a, a really narrow passage with a drawbridge. Um, and he took the helm himself. And uh, but, but by chance, you know, he was expecting the top of the ship to be ripped off like a truck going under a bridge. But by chance, a, an operator on the drawbridge raised it just in time. And Blancart guided... Uh, Ile de France through that passage with less than four feet of clearance on either side. Unbelievable. And he won a medal for it, which is fairly impressive. Yeah, so I earned you're, it. You're three up on me, which is which is fantastic um, for you. Not so fantastic for me. Uh, fact number three: Legendary naval architect William Francis Gibbs was actually blind in his left eye, the results of a childhood accident. Embarrassed if I don't know this one. Because that's near my hometown, or he was from around here. I'm going to say true. That one is bullshit. No, really? he had a use of both of his eyes. Um, if he was using only one eye, I can only assume he'd be designing half an ocean liner at a time. It would have made his life a lot more difficult. End of the uh, second round, you're still two points up on me, Mr. Linsky. Well points done. Points up. I'm coming for you. All right. You're, you're catching up. But we're, we're kind of roller coastering here. You, were, you had a significant lead in the beginning. I, I started strong and yeah. then completely lost my steam, but the, the, my third round question's a doozy, so I'm, I'm coming for you. All right, all right. All right, roll it. Question seven for me. North Korea's calendar starts the exact night that the Titanic sank, although they didn't adopt this calendar until 1997, the year that James Cameron's film came out. Um, I've got to say true, because Kim, I think it was Kim Il-sung was born April 15th, 1912. Yes, he was. Now, they, they truly did adopt the calendar in 1997. I was hoping I could throw you off by making them just sound like Titanic fans. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that true? They, they did. They adopted it that, that same year. That is yeah. bizarre. Maybe, secretly, Kim Jong-il was just really big Titanic fans. They actually co-produced two Titanic films. They did not. The two worst ones. Really? Which ones? The animated ones. I the, knew they were evil. The ones with the the uh, the octopus. I I knew that that rapping dog could have only originated in the depths of a North Korean gulag. Well, it was half Italian, half North Korean productions, and the uh, <laughs> director or the the producer's name was Kim OK. <laughs> That is not bullshit. All of the... Name all the greatest uh, cinema trilogies, and they're, they're basically all uh, North Korean-Italian productions. And Kim O.K. Okay yeah. is right up there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I am... I'm just one behind, Linsky. One just behind. One. Okay. Well, just here's one. Here's one um, about the Ile de France, you know, which you, okay. oh. you had a fact okay. about. All right. Um, I did. The SS Ile de France was the first ship in history to actually have its own wine press and bottling facilities on board with the capability of actually making their own onboard champagne as well. Um, oh, it sounds very convincingly French, but champagne sounds like it would be much more labor intensive to make than like the four or five day crossing duration. So I'm going to say bullshit. Well, you know, the ship doesn't only exist for the five days that it's at sea. <clears throat> they could be brewing it, brewing it for, like, several voyages. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I came up with this fact, and then I sat there, and I'm like, you know what, this sounds really convincing. The French might have done this. Yes. I actually, I actually called Bill Sauter, and I'm like, I made this fact up. 
was I accidentally right? And Bill's like, hmm, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> so he had Oh, so you could have Bill, convinced Yeah, Bill. Bill, Bill Sauter actually had to go and look up uh, a little bit on the uh, wine aboard French ships for me. So, wow. um, watch, somebody out there is going to be like, oh, no, the Ile de France could do that. But if any of these get challenged in the comments and, and proven, then we might actually even have to revise the revise the score. Oh, man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your, uh, your third question of the third round, Mr. Minsky. Charles Dickens' personal copy of his book, A Christmas Carol, was lost in the sinking of the Lusitania. Huh. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, I, mm, I don't know. True? Well, you won this one. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that is true. It's true. It went down with a good number of other um, literary artifacts, including uh, some of the original artwork for other other books of the time. I can't remember specifics offhand. I actually have a book in uh, in my collection from Charles Dickens' personal library. It's got his book plate in it and everything, and it just kind of blows my mind to think that it might have been next to, or at least near, that book that went down with the Lusitania. Wow, that, that is a fascinating um, historical postscript. You, you think of all the precious books that have been lost at sea. I mean, probably the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam is the most famous, but that that's incredible. Well, that one's just shiny. It was very shiny. <laughs> <laughs> Fact the first, the earliest design concept for the Olympic class called for a three-funnel design. Come on, man. Is that a trick? Well, I know it was originally going to be a three-funnel design, but since you just labeled these as trick questions, here I'm thinking, oh man, the earliest one. I'm going to say true. Bullshit. The only reference to a three-funnel design of the Olympic class that I can find is that 1908 uh, New York Times artist concept of what the ship might look like. Oh, wow. And it's just been adopted in the, you know, the, the zeitgeist as, oh, well, the Olympic was originally intended to be three funnel. Um, uh, you can't tell me that uh, White Star Line saw the four funnel German liners, the Lusitania and the Mauritania, and then intended to build a three funnel ship. Um, the earliest surviving design concept, Design D, Shows four funnels, of course. Um, presumably, there were designs A, B, and C that have been lost to lost to history. But there, there is, and anyone can challenge me in the comments. But there is no surviving record of there ever officially being a three funnel design for the uh, the Olympic class. You got me. Yeah, that's wow. an interesting one. I I always bought it, but well, cheers, man. I bought that one. Mm. I didn't want to get you on a technicality, but uh, I did, and it's my game show, so I can you do did. what I want. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Fact number two, Dr. Von Linsky. Uh, SS Leviathan introduced the world's first ship-to-shore mail service by the use of a catapult and a Fokker biplane. True. This is true. Well done. Yeah, in 1927, uh, Clarence Chamberlain uh, took off from the Leviathan flew 80 miles to New York in his Fokker biplane, presumably carrying such important messages as, Hi, Mum, I'm on a boat. Very nice. <laughs> Those Fokkers really knew how you. to carry mail. <laughs> okay, fact the third. This is the final one that I've written. Um, when Titanic departed Southampton on her maiden voyage, the pool was full of water that had been drawn in while in port, meaning that it was far too filthy to swim in. Uh, the water was flushed and refilled when finally at sea. This is a tough one because I knew it was drawn from seawater and obviously harbor water is disgusting, but I don't think they would be foolish enough to fill the pool while in harbor because they know it would be filthy. So I'm going to call bullshit on that one. But You, you, you got me, yeah. They uh, they filled it up while at sea, but it was uh, famously empty while, while in port, which is why all the photographs... Yep. Uh, say Olympic and Titanic early on in their careers show them show the pool empty um, we can only presume that had they actually filled the pool in such a manner the passengers would have probably gone off the deep end you and your puns today your ship puns man believe it or not we're tied uh, it's a tie and there are 
two facts left yet to read uh, that were written by Mr. Sean Pruitt, who is an Ocean Liner Designs crew member on the Patreon. If you haven't visited the Patreon, do so at patreon.com slash oceanlinerdesigns. You too can become a crew member and have your question read on the next episode of Bullship if we're not cancelled. We haven't been taken down by you two. <laughs> uh, okay, I think it's only fair that you read your... This is like a penalty shootout at the end of the football. It Although, is. Uh, you guys don't really have football over there. You have soccer. We have both. <laughs> we just don't watch um... one. <laughs> because you always lose. Uh, Mr. Blinsky, read... go ahead and read Sean's first uh, first fact there. Yes, sir. During the SS United States' sea trials... The ship reached a supposed top speed in the excess of 44 knots, or 50 miles per hour, or 83 kilometers per hour. That that is so fast. Uh, I I know it was quick. Um, but I always thought it was like in excess of what? What did he say? Was it in excess of 40? 44 knots, 50 miles per hour, 83 kilometers per hour. I thought it got up to the low 40s. Um, I, mm, I feel like he might be trying to trip me on a technicality. I'm going to say uh, bullshit and that it was slightly lower, maybe like low 40s. Nope, that was actually true. Um, and then he, he has a uh, fact to back that up. We can back this claim up because the ship was being escorted by a U.S. Navy destroyer and outran that destroyer by several miles per hour. Also, the ship's sea trials were cut short due to overheating bearings. When the ship arrived at Newport News, the U.S. Navy ordered there to be steam restrictions put into the SS United States because they were embarrassed that a passenger liner was outrunning the U.S. Navy. <laughs> wow, that is that is blisteringly fast. On her first voyage, they, um, it actually was going so fast that the bows paint was chipping off from the uh ripping off yeah basically just water blasting it off the ss united states could drive on a freeway in australia and be maintaining the speed limit yeah well the the incredible thing is um ss united states is near me and i pass it every time i'm heading down the shore and the speed limit on the highway that passes it is 55 so just a, a shade over it and in rush hour traffic you're not even going to make that <laughs> so it's just, it's remarkable to be going down the highway at a, a pretty good clip, look over and see her peeking out from behind the Ikea and uh, thinking that ship could do the speed you're doing right there. Well, I guess uh, now you're one point up on me. The, the pressure is on. This Thank is you, Sean. This is the final question. I thought yeah, for thanks. sure he would get that one. <laughs> thanks, but he second-guessed himself. You should just trust your gut, man. It, it, it did me well on the Nestle thing. It sure did. Yeah, okay. Well, the, uh, the fact that Sean has for me reads thus. Uh, in March 1941, the SS Bremen, again, SS Bremen, we've had two uh, double ups so far on, on ocean liner facts, Ile de France and now Bremen. The Norddeutsche liner SS Bremen went up in flames. The cause of the fire was not known for some time until a 15-year-old boy came forward uh, surrendered himself and was beheaded by the SS. You know, in all these questions, we're talking about something that sounds very French, very French to do. That sounds very SS to do. Um, I'm still going to say bullshit. <coughs> I'm, I'm so shocked. I burst out into coughing. Tragically, it's completely true. He was uh, really? executed with a guillotine. Uh Sean, this is this is meant to be a, a, a family show. What a what a note to end on. Yeah, I don't I don't know how we can. How are we going to end on that? It also means that now we've got another tie between you and I. Bonus question. All right, we'll go uh, double or nothing on this. Port is named thusly because it had to be imported because of the strength of the alcohol in the British Kingdom. It was uh, too high of alcohol content, and therefore uh, they couldn't brew it domestically, they couldn't bottle it domestically, it had to be imported, and therefore you would find it at the ports. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, a, I'm a rum guy, 
and uh, I know all that stuff was made and imported um, from plantations in, in Jamaica and what have you. Uh, true? That is bullshit, my friend. Oh. That is bullshit. It's very close to true. So, the British absolutely loved their French wines, but the French didn't love the British. So the French were actually stopping the export of their wine over to Britain. So Britain had to kind of smuggle this wine out of France through Spain and Portugal. Now, eventually, they just started importing Portuguese wines specifically from the town or the city of Porto in Portugal. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I have port and I have one. <laughs> By one. I didn't even decide that that would be the rule. That was just... Well, let's vote okay, on well, it. Okay, gonna ask a question. <laughs> 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 Alright, fine, fine, fine. Ty? No, 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 no. You, you can... You no, can it's, 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 your, it's your, your game, buddy. No, I, I decree you can have this one. Um, although I would really love those two copies of, uh, of Stolen for my, for my library. I'll get you one. The only concern, actually, is uh, it's region one. I don't know what region DVD you are in. Also, I have right no intention of watching it. House. No? I, I have no intention of watching it. I'll pick you up a copy anyway. Two copies. You want, you want two copies, don't you? <laughs> Tom, well done. That was a, that was a, a really good effort. I actually thought a lot of those would have tricked you better. Some of them you, did. Uh, you, you were uh, one up on me. Oh, well, uh, I, I'm going to go study up on my liquor history because that's what went <laughs> down this time around. <laughs> well, I, I thought oh. some of my questions would, would trip you up as well, but you stood your ground quite well. Well done, sir. You are the current leader and only leader of uh, Bullship. We do have a leaderboard. Uh, I'm going to put the graphic up now. So everyone can see it. There's Tom Linsky's name all the way at the top, with mine, with mine underneath. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this episode of Bullship, be sure to subscribe. If you have any ocean liner related facts that you'd like us to read out to one another, why not consider joining the Patreon? Did I already mention that? I'm going to do it again. Patreon.com slash OceanLinerDesigns. Come support the channel. If you enjoy what we do, you can submit your facts there. Now, Tom, you mentioned earlier that you're going to be putting out a Lusitania update. Where can we catch that? Well, you can find that on my YouTube channel, um, Part-Time Explorer. Laura, you've got a really interesting mix of videos on there. I'd recommend anyone go check it out. Uh, you can see Tom do anything from talk about ocean liner history to uh, exploring and even firing off uh, antique firearms, which I find extremely interesting. I literally just make videos about whatever the hell I want to make videos about. That's why God gave us YouTube channels. Tom, you've been a very worthy adversary. I'd like to congratulate you on winning the first episode of Bullship. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. It is a, a title that I will wear proudly. And uh, I'm honored that you brought me on to the first, the first game. I think this is an awesome idea. I want to see you keep it up. And I'd be happy to come back. I just got to think a little harder now to come up with harder questions and more of them. There will be more. Uh, don't make them harder. I don't want to lose again. I've taken this very seriously. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. As always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time on Bullshit! <laughs>